Hello, this is Ed Chapman, and this video cast is going to wrap up Part B of Unit 1 Ecology. And in this video cast, we're going to focus on number three down here, the role or the exactly what the water, carbon, and nitrogen cycles are, and explain how they connect to living things in ecosystems. So we're going to look at the water, carbon, and nitrogen cycle. And remember that these things are cycles, which means there's no beginning and no end. Uh, water, the molecules of water, the um, atoms of carbon, and the atoms of nitrogen are going around in a loop. They're used over and over again and are not lost. Okay, let's start with the water cycle. It's probably the simplest and most familiar to you. Um, important things to notice about the water cycle is the idea of evaporation versus transpiration. Um, evaporation is just when water leaves soil or, or the oceans or lakes or streams and just evaporates into the air and become condenses maybe in the clouds and falls back as rain. Transpiration is a special kind of evaporation. It's evaporation from the pores and the leaves of um, plants and it's it has to have had traveled through the roots and up through the stems and into the leaves of plants. So it's a special kind of evaporation from a living surface like, um, like a plant leaf. And transpiration is really important in biology. Um, another thing to notice is that sunlight and heat drives the water cycle. It makes things happen. So it's the heat from the sun that causes evaporation and transpiration to take place in the first place. And it's changes in the, in the atmosphere that um, cause condensed water in clouds to fall as precipitation, which could be rain, snow, sleet, hail, stuff like that. Um, also, just again, to reinforce the importance of transpiration, transpiration moves an enormous amount of water, um, tons and tons of water a day. The more plant surfaces there are, the more transpiration there's going to be. <clears throat> All right, so what I want you guys to think about and be able to answer is what effect does deforestation have on runoff, transpiration, and climate in general. Um, think about deforestation as the cutting down or removal of trees and woodland type ecosystems from an environment. Uh, what effect is that gonna have on the runoff of rainwater, uh, the transpiration of water from the living surfaces like we talked about, and maybe the climate of the region overall? Any ideas? If you can talk about these intelligently and use what you've learned, then you'll know what we mean by the water cycle. Okay, let's look at the carbon cycle next. The carbon cycle is about the movement of carbon atoms through an ecosystem. And carbon generally exists in ecosystems as CO2, carbon dioxide, which of course is in the air, or carbon can be wrapped up in biomass, okay? Which means it's stuck inside of living things as their tissues, okay? So biomass is made up of all the different chemicals that are based on carbon, organic chemicals that are inside living things. So basically for the carbon cycle, we have carbon moving back and forth from the atmosphere to living things and then back to the atmosphere. So that, that's kind of the cycle in a nutshell. But let's, let's look at it in more detail. Okay, first of all, how does the carbon dioxide get out of the atmosphere? Well, that's photosynthesis and that's taking place inside of plants. Plants remove CO2 from the atmosphere and fix it as um, biomass and in their tissues. So they're literally sucking CO2 out of the air and storing it away in a solid form. Okay. Now this CO2 is now stored as biomass, which means it's now accessible as food to food webs um, and to decomposers in food webs and consumers in food webs. So it can start moving and transferring its energy around in that, um, that one-way direction we talked about earlier. Um, some biomass can also end up not being rotted away, not being decomposed, not being eaten, just kind of piling up underground or underwater. And this is where fossil fuels like coal and petroleum come from. They're just buildup of ancient biomass that never got processed back into the atmosphere. All right, now when you burn fossil fuels like coal or petroleum, you're releasing that CO2 back into the air. And when animals or plants use the carbon that they fixed or that they've eaten and go through respiration, they release the CO2 back into the air also. So that's pretty much the cycle here. There's a lot going on um, that we haven't talked about that's pictured in this diagram, but those are the most important things. The movement of CO2 out of the atmosphere, by the action of photosynthesis and the return of carbon dioxide back to the air by the action of respiration inside of living things or just by burning uh, fossil fuels or paper or plants or forest fires. All those things release CO2 back into the air. 
All right, phytoplankton in the ocean also do photosynthesis and they capture biomass in their tissues. And because they're phytoplankton, if they don't get eaten, they're gonna settle down into ocean sediments and we can build up fossil fuels underwater also. Now, ocean water as a chemical, salt water can also absorb carbon dioxide in pretty large amounts and store it away as um, different types of ions, which I really don't wanna go into right now. But you can think of the ocean water as a giant reservoir for dissolved CO2. Now, some of the carbon dioxide gets stored as sediments, which can get transformed into limestone by some geologic processes. Again, we're not going to look too much at those this year. Okay, when plankton dies, it decomposes, and the CO2 can be released back in the air in the same way that dead plants get decomposed on land. All right, now, global warming, probably heard about this, and you may know a little bit about the connection between carbon dioxide and global warming. Well, when ocean water heats up because the air is getting warmer, the, the CO2 that's dissolved in the water can no longer stay there because warm liquids can't hold as much gas as hot liquids. So the CO2 tends to be released. The ocean holds less. Also, the warmer ocean water may kill lots of different organisms that can't live in the higher temperatures. So the net result of all this is we get more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as the atmosphere warms up. Now, the bad part about this is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere retains more heat. It kind of acts like an atmospheric blanket and it traps more heat closer to the ground. So we get this vicious cycle of um, carbon dioxide pretty much accelerating the um, warming of our atmosphere. Now, in your notebooks, if you can explain three ways that humans could reverse global warming by messing with the carbon cycle in some positive way rather than the negative ways that, we, that you probably have heard about, how could the action of, a, of humans reverse global warming by changing the carbon cycle? Think about that, write something down. If you can do that, then you understand the carbon cycle. Okay, our last cycle is the nitrogen cycle. And the nitrogen cycle is based on the movement of another atom, nitrogen. Now, nitrogen is a, is a little bit different than a lot of other elements. Um, nitrogen exists as two nitrogen atoms hooked together into a molecule called N2, or um, it's a, a diatomic molecule, I believe they call it in chemistry. And two nitrogens, two nitrogen atoms joined together are N2, and that's what's floating around in the atmosphere. And N2, or nitrogen, gaseous nitrogen, makes up about 80% of what's in the atmosphere. The rest of it, the 20% left over, is, is mostly oxygen with some other things like carbon dioxide mixed in. But 80% of the air you're breathing and that plants are exposed to is made up of nitrogen. Now nitrogen is completely harmless. You breathe it in, you breathe it out. Our bodies really don't have a use for it. It's also pretty useless to plants. Most plants can't do anything with nitrogen. But nitrogen is absolutely necessary to build molecules like proteins, DNA, RNA, and all the other molecules that are used to build living cells. So how does this nit atmospheric nitrogen, N2, become useful? Well, the answer to that is the nitrogen cycle. Uh, bacteria are the key to this. You know, bacteria in the soil and in the water and sometimes even associated with plants. Um, they can live as little symbiotic um, mutualists inside the tissues of some plants. The, nitrogens t the, the bacteria take nitrogen from the air and they fix it. Okay? They, they change it into a chemical that is no longer a gas. Okay? So this is called nitrogen fixation. This is a very important idea. And the forms that N2 gets converted to is ammonium and ammonia, okay? If you just know ammonia, that's fine. Um, NH3 or NH4 type molecules. And other bacteria can then convert the ammonia into nitrites, which is our NO2s, and finally to nitrates. And nitrates are plant fertilizers. Uh, plants can use them, to, can now access this nitrogen and use it to build the molecules they need to um, grow and reproduce. Now, I was talking about these bacteria that are associated with plant tissues. Some plants, especially groups of plants called legumes, okay, which includes all beans and peas and things like that, legumes have the ability to, to um, 
take care of these nitrogen fixing bacteria in their tissues. And what these nitrogen fixing bacteria, bacteria are able to do for these special plants is convert atmospheric nitrogen into forms, ammonia, nitrites, and nitrates, that plants can use as fertilizer to build their tissues or build their biomass. So these are really special plants and they're very useful to farmers and to agriculture in general. Okay, so these legumes I talked about, um, it's a symbiosis. This is an example of a symbiotic relationship of, between a bacterium and a plant. And it's, it's a type called mutualism because the bacteria benefit and plants benefit from this association. Uh, the legume provides things to the bacteria, water, food, and a safe wet place to live inside these special root nodules. So that's a positive for the bacteria. And the bacteria pay for their rent, so to speak, by working to convert this nitrogen into fertilizers or, or molecules that the plant can use as a fertilizer. Okay, here's an actual picture. These, I believe, are soybeans or something like a um, fava bean or something like that. And here's a close-up of the little nodules. If you dissect one of these little growths on the root, you'll find that it's absolutely packed with these nitrogen-fixing bacteria that have the special ability to convert N2 into a form that plants can use as fertilizer. All right, now one of these nitrogen-fixing bacteria is called rhizobium, and it's the one that's found in association, in this mutualistic association, with legume roots. Okay, can you now explain, use rhizobium as an example? to explain what a symbiosis is. If you can do that, then you've linked two important concepts, the idea of a symbiosis and the idea of the nitrogen cycle being based in part on the action of bacteria. All right, I think that's the end. Oh, no, here's a picture of the nitrogen cycle as a cycle. All right, we've got nitrogen in the air, that's N2, be converted by the bacteria, um, going in, you know, becoming all those fertilizers being absorbed by plants, the plants are eaten by animals, the nitrogen's now in the animals, it's in the plants' bodies, they die and decompose, um, decomposition bacteria, decomposers, do respiration, and they convert ultimately this nitrogen back into N2, and we get a nice little cycle going around and around and around. All right, that's it, stop there, thanks for listening.